So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Jim Campbell, the director of the Health Workforce Department at the World Health Organization in Geneva. It's a, a pleasure to be uh, joining today uh, this webinar presentation on a new leadership package for human resources for health uh, that has been a pleasure to develop with uh, some of our panelists and partners here today, but also uh, many others. This uh, work originates back in the 2016 glo Global Strategy for Human Resources for Health, uh, adopted by the World Health Assembly. And the requirement and the request to the WHO Secretariat that we really look at how to uh, build human capital, human capacity in HRH workforce development, management and leadership for the future. And we've had a process underway since then, looking at all the evidence, looking at all the information uh, to come forward and see where we uh, could be making a difference. What we have for you today then is, uh, next slide if we may please. Um, what we have for you today is a sterling panel of uh, longtime colleagues, partners uh, who have been involved in this work, giving a perspective on uh, some of the challenges that we see around leadership and development in different country contexts, the tool itself that has been developed uh, by the consortium of universities, uh, engaging colleagues from Brazil, from Hungary, Portugal, and South Africa, uh, colleagues will introduce themselves as they take the, the floor uh, on the first occasion, um, but it really is a, a global perspective. Next slide. Um, this is uh, just to, to recognize all those who've been engaged. Like I said, the, the consortium of university partners uh, that did the original analytical work, and in particular to uh, Professor Paulo Farinho uh, in Lisbon, Portugal, for his leadership uh, work on this, but including all the other members of the, the academic faculty engaged. Then from uh, the Global Health Workforce Network, um, Human Resources for Health Leadership Hub, who got fully engaged and supported uh, that, and across the WHO organization as well in terms of looking. So it's a real uh, collaborative effort involving all the WHO regions and involving all our partners to look at this and uh, take it forward. We've got till the top of the hour. Um, as I said, we're gonna have a couple of presentations now on the, the content and the, of the curricular package, and then we'll go into our panel discussion. So let me hand over to uh, Siobhan Fitzpatrick from the Health Workforce Department in WHO Geneva, uh, who's uh, been leading on this portfolio with Dr. Giorgio Cometo. Siobhan. Jim, thank you, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you colleagues on the call. Um, so before we hear about what is in the curricular package and how to use it, we wanted first to just go back to the origins, where this came from, why WHO values this area so much, um, and the importance of HRH leadership and management towards the achievement of universal health coverage. So Jim mentioned the 2016 uh, World Health Assembly, which adopted the resolution on um, the Global Strategy for Human Resources for Health and really gave the mandate for WHO to develop uh, postgraduate curricula for training <laughs> in HRH leadership and management. Because, of course, all of our work to strengthen the health workforce towards UHC requires health workers accessible, available, uh, of quality in the right places to achieve UHC. So uh, in this year's World Health Assembly, we um, saw the adoption of the Working for Health Action Plan, which is on the right of my slides. And again, you can see that all of these actions and investments in education, in employment, ensuring the right workforce in the right places requires those policy and leadership decisions. Next slide, please. 
So when we think about how to enable that stro strong health workforce capacity, we are thinking about interventions at all levels of the health system. So in this pyramid, this really presents the interlinkages between the different levels. So system-wide factors both require and enable interventions at the organizational level, which again, both require and enable interventions at the individual level, as well as the tools to implement those different policy options. So when we're talking about training for HRH leaders and managers, we're really focused on those individual factors. So the individual people who have responsibility for HRH leadership in their countries, regions and districts. Next slide, please. So these data are from the Afro region from 2012, and we can really see here the turnover of individuals in the HRH units within the African co continent. Um, so data from 26 countries, and at the time that this survey was, was undertaken, we can see the high turnover. Ten of those 26 countries had an, uh, a unit lead who had been in post for less than 24 months. In six countries, indeed, there had been three different leaders in the past five years. So this, of course, presents a challenge for those individuals when they are um, sort of in those positions to get up to speed quickly in all of the different options, the policy options across education, employment, investment in the health workforce to ensure sufficient HRH in their country. Next slide, please. Um, so again, this survey also identified the range of the different responsibilities of those leaders in HRH units. And we can see that from this survey, in fact, this from the Southeast Asia region, all of the respondents identified that they are involved in HRH planning. All of them are involved in the linkages between the national and the subnational. And then there are also additional responsibilities that we might find in some units, but not in others. So when we were thinking about the design of the postgraduate curriculum, we were very focused on a modular approach that would enable um, the relevance of different curricular outcomes as needed by the different individuals with different responsibilities for their context. Next slide, please. Also informing the design of the curricular development. So before we embarked on this work, WHO undertook a mapping of existing courses. So this identified more than 100 existing courses already being delivered. The majority of these are academic programs, so perhaps linked to masters or, post uh, or doctoral programs, rather than necessarily the focus on policy or particular uh, leadership interventions. So when we think about that turnover of individuals in these posts, we realize that those longer training programs are not necessarily as fast as we might need to be able to support those individuals um, to best to effectively perform in their roles. So we also found a few gaps in the delivery of uh, existing courses, mainly related to the health labor markets, for example, or information systems, HRH governance. So we were able to identify a lot of good practice from existing programs, but we also needed to fill that gap to support countries to invest in training of HRH leaders and managers in their context. Thank you. Esther, over to you. Thank you very much, dear colleagues. It's, it's a great pleasure to be here with you today and have the opportunity to present about uh, the new curricula package. Uh, on the next slide, you can see that I'm representing a whole team. Uh, as mentioned before, it's a, a big consortium of four universities uh, who take part uh, in, this, in this curriculum uh, design and development. We did have uh, uh, colleagues from Nova University Lisbon, Portugal, uh, who, who coordinated the whole uh, project. And we also had uh, colleagues uh, from uh, State University Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and the uh, University of Western Cape, South Africa. Uh, these uh, colleagues uh, were responsible for different uh, development of the different uh, training courses to be presented now. With my first slide, I really would like to uh, answer the question, why do we need this uh, new curricula package? And uh, as we all know for a long time, HRH is an essential pillar of any healthcare systems. And we need to provide accessibility, availability, acceptability, uh, and uh, quality of health workers, even if we are facing such kind of situations as the pandemics. 
The effective human resources for head leadership and management and health workforce planning can ensure adequate responses for the increasing challenges in the supply and demand. There were uh, many policy actions that aim to optimize the existing uh, care workforce and uh, also uh, thinking and considering about the, how to shape the skills and how to shape the jobs uh, in the health labor market. So um, with this in mind, in the next slide you can see uh, what is exactly this uh, HRH leadership and curriculum that uh, aims to uh, develop our resiliency and put leadership into the focus. We have three uh, packages. Uh, one is a master's course, that is the longest course with the one year uh, time duration. We have a one month course uh, training uh, that is a, a shorter one and the executive training course uh, that is the shortest one. These all are uh, structuring to recognize, formalize, and build a critical mass of leaders and managers that is much needed in the area of HRH development. This is a very, very tangible tool in our hands and very important tool in our hands to strengthen HRH leadership and management in member states, to develop system thinking, and in turn to achieve a stronger HRH to deliver universal health coverage. Who are the beneficiaries, current and aspiring HRH leaders and managers? Everybody who is uh, working in the HRH uh, management field and who are responsible for making decisions in different levels. We have different study uh, uh, domains of study cycles, as you can see on the graph, like policy and planning is in the focus, management, communication, HRH intelligence, data. Data is also a very crucial part of uh, the, the curricular package and research. So in the next slide, you can see the methodology, how we carried out this uh, project. As mentioned before, the four universities uh, um, had continuous dialogue uh, with the leadership hub uh, of the global network of uh, health workforce, WHO headquarters and regional personnel. We did uh, discuss a lot about the, the different focus, the scope of the study cycle, the target groups, and uh, there was an iterat iterative development of this training course. In the next slide, you can see uh, the overview of this uh, prototype curricular package. In this package, we have seven parts uh, from which the overview, the case studies and glossaries are uh, concerning all of the, the three length uh, courses. And you can find the detailed descriptions of the master course of the one month course and the executive course as well. We do have a facilitator guide that helps uh, to organize the executive short course. Obviously, uh, this can be supplemented by local case studies, local uh, examples and experiences of the teachers and educators. In the next slide, there is a, uh, th there is a short overview about the huge, huge target audience that this curriculum is aiming. In the strategic level, we have the, the, the senior level technical policy making managerial staff who are there for good governance, who set the view, the vision, how we can handle HRH strategies in different countries, for example. The other important target group is the operative level. There we have the middle level managers, the technical staff, all those who are implementing uh, the different HRH management programs, interventions. The important uh, target audience is the leaders of different uh, professional associations, councils, the regulatory bodies, NGOs, research institutes, educational. So all those who are involved in age or age policy matters. Uh, the next slide shows the eight cross-cutting learning objectives that we identified for the training courses. The first three focuses on health workforce policy, strategy, management, and implementation, and how important it is to know and understand its benefits to, to uh, healthcare reforms. We do uh, deal a lot uh, with change management because we do need to lead an effective change. 
the leadership focus is there. So the agile and participatory leadership is the key in this training program. Uh, also, it is important to identify the appropriate literature that could serve as an evidence in policy making. And uh, the last uh, very important two points are how to translate the knowledge, the skills and the competencies into everyday life practice. In the next slide, you can see uh, that uh, we did work with modular structures. We identified modular learning objectives and learning outcomes. Uh, they are very uh, important and there is a detailed description how we pictured these training courses. We suggested the time frame, we suggested learning activities within the different modules. We suggested how to assess and how to evaluate uh, the students, how to evaluate their work and how to give, provide feedback. We also put uh, recommended readings and additional bibliography to each of the curricular units in the modules. And case studies are there to support the study. The next slide, you can see uh, some, some more details on the master's program that uh, is uh, uh, built up from six modules. The master's program is the longest program that allows participants uh, to improve decision making based on academic evidence. It aims to strengthen HRH leadership and management competencies. The overall program is one year long, representing uh, one package of coursework and an additional coursework for dissertation writing. After the master's program, we can see in the next slide the one month program that consists of six modules as well. The modules are built up and aim to enable participants to develop leadership skills for policy dialogue, to improve stakeholder participation, ownership and accountability in policy development and implementation. The one month course has a duration of 160 hours and, uh, and these are uh, for effective investments, acknowledging leadership, effective policy dialogues, policies and plans that are in the focus of this training. On the next slide, you can see uh, some information on the executive course that is a short course and really aims and targets uh, senior level uh, leadership. Um, the focus is on strategic level, how, how to boost up policy making and decision making in HIH intelligence. It consists of two modules and really draws on the extensive experience of the participants. It is really using the peer learning method and approach. So we really wanted to uh, highlight the importance of one week virtual or, or presidential uh, course that can be um, complemented with a one week of self-study. So both, uh, both uh, modules uh, have like a very, very detailed agenda plan uh, for, for the educators. And the last slide, uh, you can see some of the approach. One uh, very important uh, part is the competency-based learning. And uh, all the detailed description, you will see that we did use synchronous and asynchronous activities and also very important highlights we put on evaluation of the coursework and evaluation of the studies of the participants. So with uh, this very brief overview, I thank you for your attention and we are here uh, with the colleagues to answer the questions that you ha might have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Siobhan uh, for the background and Esther, for some of that detail on behalf of the, the consortium of universities and partners that were engaged in the process. Um, we're going to go now to the, the panel session and get a few reflections. Uh, obviously, the tool and the curriculum is, is really designed to have impact at, in the national setting, in the national context, to build capacity uh, of uh, workforce scientists, workforce experts 
around the world. And so I'm delighted to be joined and have perspectives today from, from Brazil, from Mozambique, from Peru, uh, and from across the work of AMREF in, in Africa. Uh, but let me turn first to uh, Professor Patti Garcia, who's, uh, Patti, it's a privilege to, to have you joining. Uh, Patti is the, the professor at the School of Public Health at the Cayetano Heredia University in Peru, uh, the former minister in Peru and the former dean of the School of Public Health. Uh, she is a, a true, uh, excellent example of women in global health leadership. Um, Patti, how can this tool help you, in, in given your experience in your context? Uh, how can this tool help? Okay, so first of all, let me um, thank you for the opportunity and congratulate. I think this is a great day because we are um, we are launching or you are launching a tool that um, could help us all. Um, I think the pandemic has shown us that we have um, delayed several things that we needed to do for the most important pillar of our health systems, which are the human resources. So I think this is great. Um, it, I was looking at the tool and the three different uh, versions or forms of delivery. And actually, um, I think they, they are addressing probably the most pressing things that I have seen in my own country. Okay, one of the things that was said is the fact that there is a lot of turnover. So if you pretend to have people trained once you once they are in the job, okay, for a master's degree or whatever, I mean, at, at the midpoint of the master's, probably they will not be there anymore. And um, so you have wasted your time. So having the alternative of having a, an executive form plus a one month form, I think it's it's brilliant, okay? So I think it's great. Um, the, the issues that they are including as part of the materials, things like leadership, things like governance, things that are not part usually or have not been taken into consideration into training, um, I think are important and believe it or not, the people that are usually working in, this, um, in, in these positions, uh, may are, are looking for ways of doing better their job and they don't have how to do it. In Peru, for example, um, as a minister of health, I saw that it's a big problem and still is a big problem, how to plan for the present and for the future, okay? And so, and I have seen that this is a very important issue and how to collect information, for example, and analyze the information. I think we have very little information about our health providers, our health workers. And actually during the pandemic, for example, I mean, from one moment to the other, we have less than 30% of the physicians working because they were over 65 years old or they have a diseases that were not counted in any database, okay? Um, in, in general, I would like to make and I'm sorry, but there are like 10 points, 10 very important points that I have seen and, and I'm very excited about, okay? So number one is that um, this curriculum is taking the what, how, the whom. It's including things like the levels of learning, the levels of learning. And when I talk about levels of learning, I'm talking about informative, formative, and transformational. Okay, and they are including these three levels of training in the different forms of delivery, but also within the contents. So we're giving them not only information, but skills and skills that can make them transformative in their job, number one. The second, I think it's really great that it's including one issue that we have been ignoring, which is the labor market analysis. So we cannot ignore that there is a market there, okay? Um, the third point is that there is a module on human resources education, okay? And that I think it's going to allow to see if we can break the gap that exists between the ministries of health and the institutions that are producing the, the human resources for health. And that's a problem that I have seen in Peru. Universities are on one side, and what we need at the Ministry of Health is on the other side. And we have never really sit down, we started to sit down 
both of them to see how can we, and that's part of the planning too, how can they produce the type of health professionals that we need? So this thing, I think it's important as a module. The fourth issue, which is really great, is that in these modules, they are including a, the well-being of the human resources, their health, their physical and mental issues that several times had been ignored. The fifth point is the resilient. I, I, I thought that was a great module, the module that talks about resilience and capacity to respond to emergencies. At the time I was Minister of Health, we started an evaluation. Peru is a country that had earthquakes, okay? And you know, we realized that if there was a huge earthquake that will break Lima, Lima is a huge city with 12 million people in two, on one side, we will have the hospitals and on the other side will be the health workers because they live completely separate and we don't have any plan to how to really work on these. So starting to think about resiliency and the capacity to respond to emergencies is, is nowadays critical. Number six, for me, which I also think it's brilliant, when talking about the policies, how can you manage dual practice in our countries? Unfortunately, that has caused in several settings, conflicts of interest and corruption too. Okay, so I'm gonna talk on, not only about governance, but also about issues that have to do with corruption. Number seven, I really applaud the fact that you have used lots of the concepts that come from the Lancet Commission on Education of Health Professionals for the first century. So including global, because you are producing a document that can really help globally, that, is in, that includes interdisciplinarity, that is evidence-based. And, um, and it's going to be quite important to have that. If, so those recommendations seen in something that is practical, that is like this curriculum. Number seven, and it's only 10, so don't worry. Number seven, I think the highlight of how important information is, and not only to collect information, but how to analyze it, okay? It's critical. And my last two points had to do with some things that I, I think the curriculum is making me think that we need to, to really work all together, probably. So now, having all these materials that are excellent with videos, references, suggestions on how to do things, etc. So I think the next point is, how can we work a cadre of training trainers. So how can we work on this training of trainers? And how can we make this process not a one point, but a dynamic process, okay, in which there will be the opportunity of creating a repository, for example, of case studies, new references, and maybe a community of practice that could allow this to be a living process that will evolve. So, and my last point is that I will like also to see how in this whole curriculum, we start, I mean, this leadership and governance is a very important point, but we have to sometimes use the words and so people will understand because we cannot deny then another thing that is really making our health system sick is corruption. So how can we, within these issues, also talk about how to evaluate the risks and prevent and manage corruption that could be there? And how can we really give the tools to the administrators, but also they could give the tools to the health workers to try to fight this from the bottom up? So I think this is transformative. Thank you so much. I'm really very excited and congratulations. Thank you very much, Patty. And, and I'm sure that the, the architects of this will be very, very uh, flattered by that uh, perspective and those 10 points. Um, let me turn to Alexandra. Alexandra Mangueli, the general director of the Instituto Superior de Ciencias de Saúde in Mozambique. Again, another uh, exceptional career, the former minister, the former national director of health, the former Inspector General in Mozambique. Alexandra, such a wonderful experience. Mozambique. 
How can we help? How can, how can this help you and your, your colleagues? You can turn your, you're on mute, Alexandra, turn your mic off. Alexandra, we're on mute. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. I start by co congratulating WHO by launching this initiative. It is one more step on leading the intervention with the national health services in the countries. I always got to see WHO supporting the health system in Mozambique in all different areas where I used to work uh, at the district level up to the central level as the Minister of Health. The WHO has always facilitated my activity as a health manager in Mozambique, particularly within the most difficult moments. I take this occasion to express my immense gratitude. ISISA was created about 19 years ago. Its main objective was to stabilize human resources in national health services. It's our perception that it has been able to live, to live up to expectations. Our graduates perform their work in a competitive way. However, public opinion is not unanimous regarding the quality of human resources for health in the country. Here, we realize that training in leadership of human resources for health is not being carried out within the necessary emphasis. It is very difficult to provide quality health care in the, in the country with a society economic, socioeconomic level like ours. The necessary requirements are not always met. To provide satisfactory health care, it is necessary qualified and motivated human resources with permanent training, good salaries, good working conditions where there is no shortage of medicines and other necessary means to care for sick. The teams have to be properly organized where each one does the best he is able to do. There, there must be good leadership, a very competent leadership. Good le leadership is very important. Without good leadership, the risks of serious disciplinary problems increase, which generates frustrations and can lead to poor customer services and even paralysis, paralysis of services. I salute, congratulate, and I thank you on behalf of my organization for this magnificent work of launching a curriculum of leadership training in human resource for health at the academic level of master's degree. Allow me to assure you that you are very interested in this curriculum and we ask you to look at us as authentic partners in this challenge. Let me inform you that CISA has already contacted Mozambican Minister of Health, Professor Armindo Tiago, who was curious and the matter and following our conversation, he invited me to a meeting that will be held at the end of this October of the Human Resource Observatory. The Minister of Health, the Minister of Higher Education, Professor Daniel Nivagar, supports our uh, desire of the joint of this initiative with support of WHO. The WHO representation of the country 
with whom we have already spoken, all showed a willingness to cooperate. Naturally, to implement this project, we will have to make the necessary adjustment in accordance with the Mozambican law on higher education without any prejudice to the project that we are launching here. For, the, for this, we have the support of a great cooperation partner that we have in Portugal at the University Universidade de Nova Lisboa. Our strategic partner is the Instituto de Higiene e Medicina Tropical. Naturally, in order to implement the project, we'll have to make the necessary adjustment in accordance with the, with the Mozambican law. Please, we ask you to support this strategic partnership so that together we can improve leadership in human resource for health in Mozambique. Countries with limited resources must fight for more resources, but they have a duty to improve the leadership of human resources in health immediately. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Alexandra. And what a wonderful announcement uh, that we have there from Mozambique, the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Education, looking at the appropriate regulation to actually take this and put it into practice and have, and have an impact on that human capital and development. So, Alexandra, we, we look forward to it. And obviously, with our Portuguese-speaking Lucifone connections and partners, Look forward to assisting you in those endeavors. Thank you very much uh, for that. Thank you. Uh, let's get uh, stay with the African continent, and, and I'm going to invite uh, Joaquim Kimosa, who's the an assistant professor and the vice chancellor at Amref's International University, and also the director of regional programs in the field offices at Amref South Africa. Joachim, you you've been in the the, the business of education. Uh, human capital development for many, many years. Uh, AMREF, one of our you know, core partners on the, the ambition of universal health coverage and health equity. Uh, how might you and other civil society organizations start to be able to uh, deploy and utilize this tool? Thank you. Thank you uh, for this invitation to give a view. Um, as you've said, I work for a university, AMREF International University, which is uh, a Pan-African um, uh, health-oriented university, a university of applied health sciences. And we are part of the wider network of AMREF Health Africa, which is the largest uh, health professional de health development organization uh, in Africa. Now, I have four things I wanted to say concerning um, this uh, prototype curricula or prototype curricula. And uh, the first one is that I'm basically a medical doctor. And when I graduated from medical school and was sent out to work together with my colleagues, I was immediately made a leader in the health sector. And uh, after internship, you actually got posted to be a head of a district health system. In medical school, we learned nothing about management. And many other colleagues in different fields of uh, health, including nurses, uh, public health people, and uh, laboratory people, we are trained on technical issues of health, not on how to manage the health system. And I think it is for this reason that health indicators for a long time in continents like ours here in Africa have remained difficult to change. It is not because our doctors are not well-trained. It's not because our nurses are not well-trained or laboratory technologists. It is because of the management issues that are in health and which are very complex that have been difficult for us to navigate. And so a lot of discussions have happened around this. People have even said, because the health people are unable to manage the health system, let's bring people who are not in the health sector to manage it for them. And some people have tried that as well. 
But we also know that managing health services has not just the technical management and leadership issues, there are ethical issues to be considered. And decision can mean life or death to populations. And so it is very complicated. My view has been that we need people who are in health as well as those who are not in health to work together to manage health services. But in that spectrum of things, we've not had as what we can call a standard way or a standard curriculum for training these people. Whether they are people who are trained as managers who are not health related or people who are health related and being put in management, I think we need to have a common understanding of some things. Now, what I find important with this curriculum is that it's trying to um, solve that problem. Solve the problem where very well-trained people in medicine, in nursing, in health courses are also leaders who are not trained in leadership, while also having people who are non-medical and non-health coming to health to be able to offer uh, strategy and management issues. Now, if we take them through a curriculum like this, it helps to standardize the way we think, and it tries to solve a lot of conflicts which we also see in the health sector between health workers and their managers, between health leaders and those who are you know, providing services. We need to solve that and this curriculum offers a window for doing that. The other thing I want to say is that I've looked at the approaches. Now that I lead a university, I know that uh, we do a lot of top-down training uh, where you sit in a class, and you are told what you don't know, and you are supposed to absorb it, and then you are told to reproduce it in an exam. We have learned that people don't learn when you do that. The retention is for the exam period, and after the exam is done, that's the end of it. Now, this curriculum has developed different approaches that can help to impart knowledge and retain knowledge over a long time, and not just that, apply knowledge in practice. And that is very important in education because we are not just in the business of using money to uh, you know, train people. We want to see products. We want to see outcomes of those trainings. I believe that if the methods that have been described in this, uh, this curricula uh, is used, if those methods are used in the training, then we are going to have people who are better uh, you know, in applying the management knowledge uh, that is so, so important. Now, the other thing is for a long time, even within the university where I work and within AMREF Health Africa, there are so many uh, courses which we have developed and there are a number of courses other partners have developed. And you talked about um, there's so many courses that uh, you had to look at and to evaluate before coming up with this one. That's a problem we've had in the sector because people will come and say, I'm trained in management, but you cannot really identify what is that which is called trained in management. What have they covered? What competencies do they have? So we needed one curriculum which puts everything under one roof. And I think this curriculum has tried to do that. And so that helps a lot because we can then say, this is a person who has undergone training based on what is offered under the WHO prototype of curriculum. I think standardizing is very important so that if you are an employer, you know what your kind of, uh, you know, the person you are employing has covered. Now, um, finally, what I want to say is that in the university where I work, we already offer some form of training in these courses, but not as a standalone program. Uh, it is part of the health systems uh, training that we do. We have courses in that. And we are going to use these prototypes for reference for the different courses that uh, we are offering. But more importantly, and I want to ask uh, WHO uh, this, that we work together. We are Pan-African. We are able to reach many countries. We work together to find a way of launching these calls uh, in a way that we are able to deliver it to these different countries. And we have the framework and networks to do that. 
So we are committed to working with you to make sure that this very good product which you have developed reaches the targeted audience. That's the commitment I want to make on behalf of my colleagues in AMREF. And thank you very much for our work well done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joachim, for, for that. And we look forward to continuing that Pan-African opportunity, both, uh, I think, the, the emphasis from President Ramaphosa, which I know AMREF is participating for a new public health order in Africa, uh, and also President Biden with his Global Health Worker Initiative. Uh, I think there's clearly an opportunity to make those connections there. Um, finally, then, let me turn to a, a, a former uh, WHO staff member and a, one, a champion for human resources for health around the world. And I see in the chat already testimony that he's fighting for the improvement of HRH in Brazil. Um, Mario Del Poz. Uh, Mario is the professor and former vice director of the Instituto of Social Medicine in the Rio de Janeiro State University. Uh, Mario, I got a Brazil perspective, we, we, we know the work that you've been doing for many decades, but there's a particular question in the chat that I'd also like you to look at, which is, you know, we've got this package, we've got this curricula, we're going to be implementing, we've heard from Mozambique, we've heard from Peru, uh, a Pan-African initiative, how are we going to make sure that the its implementation, how are we going to capture its implementation and continue to improve it at the same time as delivering it? Mario. Well, uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, but before I, I, I make my comment, I'd like, I'm pleased to see some of the colleagues here, even at this distance. Uh, Alexandre Mangeli from Mozambique, the colleague from MRF. Uh, and I would like to thank my colleague, Esther, Esther uh, who just presented the, the, the HH prototype uh, curriculum uh, package on behalf of the consortium that was uh, led by Professor Paulo Ferrinho and also had uh, uh, Professor Uta Lemo from School of Public Health uh, from Western Cape as, uh, as uh, the backbone of the, the, the group. Uh, I learned a lot and then it was nice, enjoyable project. Uh, but also to, to thank WHO for their financial support and collaboration, especially uh, Giorgio Cometo. I, I, I I'm, 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 was a... a, a, a a nice partnership during the whole process, and Shubham uh, and, and you, Jim, uh, the front of the, the, the department, who uh, worked with us all the all the time, and somehow gave a, a perspective, the link linkage with the with the global HH global strategy. Well, uh, let me start for 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 say that uh, I guess uh, the the pandemic uh, uh, gave us more responsibility in this area, uh, more demand for HR. We are all confronted with a lot of complex issues that require quick responses that uh, the health systems were uh, not well prepared. Uh, there are lots of issues that we could identify. I'm not going to, to go through all of them, but uh, uh, HR, HR policy, leadership, manage, management uh, in all the regions, are lacking, and I said pandemic just highlighted the, these issues: uh, unsafe conditions, uh, absenteeism, uh, uh, something that was mentioned uh, uh, by Patty on the, the the health of house workers. Uh, anyway, lots of uh, uh, issues: discrimination, uh, uh, fear, things that we 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 saw in, in the past with HIV AIDS and other or the, uh, 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 say, epidemics or, or, or health emergencies, uh, that uh, the area uh, was not, uh, 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 the whole system uh, in most of the counts are not able to respond adequately in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a way that uh, 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 could reduce the mortality uh, uh, and also reduce the burden on health workers. Um, uh, in, in the context also in general were not good in terms of uh, HIH data availability uh, and I would say un scientific uncertainty we faced um, uh, well here in this country uh, we, we had a huge we had we still have a huge issue on that uh, and, and no political support so 
I would say even non-pandemic conditions uh, situation before that, the, 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 the issues on HR highlighted by Alexander and Joaquin and, and Pat uh, uh, made us, uh, uh, put us in difficult situation. Quality of care, dual practice, uh, multiple employment. In Latin America, this is a, we're full of these issues. Um, and and a, a confused and, and conflictive regulatory, uh, 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 say, framework on, on mechanism to improve health work distribution, for example. So the, this agenda cannot be moved forward without proper leadership. I think uh, Pat uh, highlighted that, uh, what uh, the, the, the modules that Esther presented, uh, some of the remarks here. Uh, uh, so technically, politically, and scientifically uh, uh, leadership, I would say. And, and how we could, uh, uh, the, the question that uh, uh, Jim made, how we could put this forward uh, and, and use the, 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 this product that was just published by WHO and presented by STAIR uh, in a way that uh, uh, tools and set of content could be articulated to develop this leadership, to make available people able uh, uh, to uh, contribute to respond uh, well, the huge challenge that you have post pandemic, but also uh, the, the, the probably uh, uh, a continuation of uh, health emergencies uh, be, uh, by, by other virus on, or, 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 or situations like we have uh, in Peru, earthquake, or Mozambique with, uh, with the floods, etc. So I think uh, uh, the experience that we have here in Brazil, and I'm going to, to, to refer to that, uh, uh, may be interesting. Uh, 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 we have uh, several institutions that are already offering parts of the, this uh, 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 say content, but in a, in a, in a very, uh, I would say, uh, unfashionable way, a part of a very uh, hard academic uh, uh, programs uh, and, and, and not linked with the needs of health systems uh, or we need of the, the, the health, uh, regional health departments. Uh, there are some experience on, on professional masters, as you call here, uh, offering uh, masters in management, uh, general management for health, uh, very few uh, elements of HR. And, and, and at the end of the day, uh, uh, the students uh, uh, are asking uh, for um, tools on the chart that could help them. You see, and 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 so we 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 thought that maybe uh, to use the the, the uh, what the this uh, this program, I would say the tentative, uh, 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 not tentative, but but prototype of curricula in different elements. Could be in a, a, I think as Pat mentioned, in a, in a in a partnership between the the institutions that are responsible for the health systems. In Brazil, we have a, 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 a say every every province or state uh, has its own uh, health department uh, that could be put together with the academic uh, environment. Uh, we have some experiences, but uh, not in this uh, in in this way. Uh, yeah. the, the last experience that we had was the HH Observatory. Um, I, I I was uh, part of the the experience in, in, in when I was WHO, but even before that, uh, uh, was able to make this partnership around HH data, around yeah. HH information, uh, to bring. Uh, uh, to be able to make discussions, to discuss priority, but not necessarily to intervene uh, in the education process. Um, uh, and I Mario, think... if I can just interrupt you there, just to, to bring you to a close, so we're just going to get a few more. Yes, please. Um, so, exactly. So, four fantastic examples and some real commitments 
already on the table. And just listening uh, to some of the discussions, I was just also looking through at our uh, attendees. We've got people from Australia, from South Africa, from Malaysia, from Bangladesh, from America, from different parts of the WHO, PAHO included, uh, in Washington. So great, some familiar names and some new names in there. But I was just struck by both what Patty and uh, Mario was saying about this implementation opportunity, a community of practice. Uh, and we do have colleagues from Washington here as well. We, we've seen the announcement, Patty, Mario, about the Americas Summit, the Summit of the Americas and the development of America's Health Corps, which is looking to train 500,000 people across the Americas uh, in uh, having an impact across that. That could be something not only on the Peru side, the Brazilian side, but a, a Latin American connection with the Summit of the Americans. I look forward to, to exploring that with our colleagues to see if that's an opportunity to come further forward as well. Uh, and similarly, um, comments in the chat from, from El Sheikh in Sudan, from uh, Professor uh, Dr. Enamul Hake in, in the BRAC International. Uh, we look forward to continue to strengthen the, the partnerships uh, in all WHO regions to actually use this tool, continue to strengthen it and going further forward. Um, colleagues, this is a first a uh, first opportunity to inform you all about the tool, to say it's on the website, to thank everybody that's been involved in the journey to develop it. But like anything the WHO publishes with our partners, we really have uh, looked forward to the country implementation, the country use, the adaptation, the, uh, the adaptation. So with Alexandra, in Mozambique, with Joe, I came across Africa. We look forward to helping you take that further forward. We also have coming up next year the fifth global forum on human resources for health, which will be held during World Health Worker Week um, from the 3rd, 4th, and 5th of April. Uh, it will be a hybrid program. Uh, we want to really focus and use the opportunity. Uh, to be continuing that discussion in the global forum, but with examples not just of commitments, but with examples of, of implementation uh, in that period and what's going to come further forward. And really then to pick up on some of the 10 points that Patty suggested and others suggested. So if we look at the challenge at country level, what are we going to learn from the COVID experience? What are we going to keep? What are we going to do better so that in the second half of the SDG goals, which will run from July 23 to December 2030, we learn all these lessons and start to apply them at scale uh, so that our workforce science, our workforce intelligence, our workforce leadership and management is fit for purpose towards the ambition of UHC and health security. Um, so look forward to working with you all in there. Um, let me echo also the compliments that we've heard today to the, the colleagues within WHO, um, Siobhan and Giorgio, uh, for all their work, for all my regional colleagues that have been engaged, do appreciate all yours. And again, to the consortium and the Global Health Workforce Network. Pleasure, everybody. Have a lovely day wherever you are. Uh, and we'll be back in touch with more information on the tool and its application. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Gracias, Patty. Thank you. Obrigado, Alexander. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so you. much. Bye-bye. Bye, Esther. Thank you. Bye, Cody. Bye.